Acts 11, 19 through 30. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. 1 John 4, 1 through 11. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God has, was manifested among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The Gospel for the sixth Sunday of Easter is John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Let's pray. O oh God of love, we give you thanks that according to your great mercy and grace, you came to us. Jesus, you came to us to be the sacrifice to appease anger, that our sins might be forgiven and that we might live in you as you live in us. So open now your word to our understanding. Open our hearts and minds, we pray in your precious name. Amen. It, it seems so simple, doesn't it? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And because he's loved me, then he wants me to love you. But what does it really mean to love? The world today would give us a great variety of definitions. And that slogan, love wins, would seem to imply that as long as you let everyone do what pleases them, then you are loving them. And yet that's not what we see defined here, or that is not how we see love defined here in God's Word. So to better understand what love is, we need to go to God's Word, where He actually defines by manifestation by example, what love really is. Not some fluffy ball of feel-goodness, not some condoning of whatever makes you feel good. We're going to turn to our First John lesson, where we have more clearly defined for us what it is that God has done in love, and by that then see a definition of love, what it means that the Father loved Jesus and that Jesus loves us. So we first see, as we look at verse 9 of 1 John 4, that God has, the word translated here is manifested, that God has shown us what love is. 1 John 4, 9 reads, And this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that, you, so that we might live through Him. So, yes, how do we know what love is? How do we define love except that God has defined it for us, right? Isn't that what it means that the love of God was made manifest among us? He showed us by what He did what love is. He gave us His Word, the written record of His love. He inspired His servant, and maybe we might say His friend, John, whose gospel we read this morning, and a piece from whose first letter we read, 
to show us, to teach us, to manifest to us, to explain to us what love is. And here is the core of the manifestation of love. It's, it's the manifestation of God himself. It's God himself showing himself to us. God shows us his love in that God sent, and, and we have here a, a term that is unique to Greek culture and Greek language. It, it's a word that we don't really fully define in English. It's a combination of actually two words. A word for one, and the word from which we get our English word genes. So like one gene, not, not you know, like denim, but the, the information in each one of our cells that determines what we are. You know, that we inherit from our fathers and our mothers, that determines uh, our skin color, our eye color, our hair color, our height, that determines our gender, our sex, all of that is predetermined by God in our genetics. The word here then has a similarity to that, to genetics, and sometimes we translate it only son, sometimes we translate it one and only son, sometimes we translate it only begotten son, and that's the term that we use in our Nicene Creed when we confess that Jesus was not made, but that he was begotten. So what does that mean? He's not created. He is not born. So this word really points us to the fact that there is only one in all existence who has this nature. That God sent the one and only being, His Son, into the world. And we know here that the world is, yes, onto our planet, but more so into our culture, into a culture that is in opposition to God, into a culture that refuses to bow to God's will and purpose, the world, that influences us away from God and His love. So to show us His love, God sent His Son, and then we, you know, we have to at some point consider the mystery of the Trinity. Because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all God, and yet we do not have three gods, but we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all united in the one Godhead, and so it is this God who sends the second person of the Trinity, the Son, into the world. And the purpose of His coming is so that we might live. So that presupposes that we are dead. In order for us to have life given to us, then to what do you give life? To something that was not previously alive. To something that is dead. And so in order for us to fully understand what it means that God loves us and to understand what this word love is about, we begin by God revealing himself to us in the Son, in the second person of the Holy Trinity, the only one in this category who came to us into our rebellious culture to give us life. Well, so then how does that work? What did he do in order for us 
to be taken out of death and into life. So we continue with verse 10. In this is love. So again, we're, we're continuing this conversation about what love is. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So it, it is all about God acting on our behalf and for us, but we're stuck with this phrase, to be the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? How is that connected to the giving of life? Well, just like we have to presuppose that we are dead in order to have life, here the foundation of the gospel is the reality of sin. Beginning with Adam and Eve, we have failed to trust that what God has said is true. We fail to believe that what God has for us is good and right. And we rebel. We stop trusting. We say that we want to be our own gods and are in control ourselves. That we want to do whatever makes us feel good. And so the world's concept of love is a distortion and a lie. We need to come face to face with the reality of sin, with our ungodliness and our unrighteousness. The fact that we don't want to be in fellowship with God. Well, you know, we sort of want to be, but on our own terms. We don't want it to be on His terms. We, we don't want it to be according to His standards. We want to set the standards for it. And so we break His law. And because we are sinners, God's Word is clear to declare to us that God is angry. God's wrath has been revealed to us against our ungodliness, against our unrighteousness. God's wrath demands judgment. And the judgment against us is eternal separation from God. That's just the reality that Scripture proclaims. It's the reality that the world doesn't want to hear. The world wants to think that we can be good enough, or that we are, by nature, good enough, or that God's love doesn't care about our behavior, or our lack of faith, or faith, or all of that stuff, and that because God loves us, none of that matters. But Scripture is clear to us that God's wrath is poured out against our ungodliness and our unrighteousness. And when God in His wrath speaks, He condemns. And we are destined for eternal separation from God. So this is then where love comes into all of this that God does not want to be eternally separated from us. He does not want us to be eternally separated from Him. He wants us to be in eternal fellowship with Him, but on His standard. And so, how does He solve this problem? The God who is a God of wrath is also a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. And so, to deal with his own wrath, the second person of the Trinity comes to us, sent to be the propitiation for our sins. So, big theological word, right? Propitiation. 
It's a word foreign to us who live in a culture 2,000 years, 3,000 years removed from the people of Israel. They understood propitiation. They understood it from the Exodus, and maybe even before. Perhaps they understood it from Abraham, who was told to sacrifice his son Isaac, and where God provided a ram in his place. A substitutionary sacrifice. They understood it from the Passover lamb, whose blood was spread on the doorposts of their homes so that death would pass by, pass over their homes. They understood it at the sacrifices at the tabernacle and later at the temple, where blood was used to show the substitution, the life of an animal given for the life of the sinner. And so Jesus then is the fulfillment of the ram on the mountains of Moriah. He is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. He is the fulfillment of the sacrifices for sin. And so we then understand that propitiation is a sacrifice that takes away wrath. The only way for God's wrath not to condemn us is for us to come under the sacrifice that takes that wrath away. And that is love. It is not that our sins don't matter. It is not that we are allowed to live as we please. It is not that we are allowed to live for ourselves according to our own rules. It is that we are sinners. That God's wrath is poured out against us sinners and that the only solution to the condemnation and separation is for the Son the second person of the Trinity, working together with the Father and the Holy Spirit to be the sacrifice that takes away wrath. And that is love. That God sacrificed himself so that we would be forgiven so that we would not have to serve the sentence against us because Jesus served it for us. So then, what God desires of us is that because we have been loved in that way, that we then extend that to each other. 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Exactly what Jesus said, John 15, 17. These things I command you, that you love, that you will love one another. If God, it begins with if God. And the reality is that yes, God did. Because God did. Not because there is anything in me that can do it but because God acted first, because God came to us, because God came for me. If God so loved, and he did, then we also, we are then transformed to love each other with the love that Jesus has for us. And we see then how this plays out for us, going back to our Gospel, John 15, in verse 13, greater love has no man or no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. 
Jesus laid down his life so that we could be his friends, so that we would have our friendship with him restored. That's what reconciliation is. And so we also then are called upon to not live for ourselves, but to live for the benefit of the other. Just as Jesus lived and died for our benefit and was raised to life for our benefit, we also then need to be servants of one another. Not demanding our own way, but encouraging each other to live in God's way and giving up the self for the other. God manifested himself. God showed himself in this way, exemplifying for us love through his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And he calls on us, having received the benefits of that sacrifice, to share it with each other. Gracious Lord Jesus, we can only give you thanks for such a great gift for love so deep that you experienced for us and in our place the punishment we deserve for our rebellion, for our breaking the law, for our sin. And we pray that as we are forgiven, we would live that transformed life loving each other as you have loved us. We ask and pray in your precious name. Amen.